Hey, welcome everybody. We'll get we'll get started in a minute. Just give another minute or two for people to roll in. People who weren't in the lobby waiting. All right, well, the participant number has, seems to level off, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everyone to AIA Virginia's Resiliency Week 2023. In our run up to Earth Day this weekend, we wanted to tackle the idea of resiliency and what that means. So we see resiliency as a proactive approach to the changes of our world, whether they be environmental, social, or economic. Our solutions need to be holistic while bringing together the related stakeholders. This program includes four presentations over the course of the week. So today we have Shoreline Restoration and the Elizabeth River Project featuring Sam Bowling and Louisa Black. Tomorrow we have Community Economic Transitions and Resilience featuring Anthony Flacavento. Wednesday we have Decarbonization and the Built Environment with Michael Lennox from the Darden College of Business. And Friday, we have Master Planning for Resiliency with Paula Loomis. Um, it's going to be a great week. Please try to continue to join us throughout the week if you can. And now I will pass it off to Wary Smith to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it is going to be a great week. And I'm very excited uh, for the presentation that we have today and for the entire week that we have planned. Um, today, we're going to be discussing shoreline restoration uh, and the important work that the built environment plays in promoting a healthy ecosystem and watershed. Um, we have two uh, very incredible uh, presenters today to talk about shoreline restoration uh, and specifically the Elizabeth River Project. Um, first, I'll introduce uh, Louisa Black. Uh, Louisa is the Resilience Manager for the Elizabeth River Project. Uh, she is an artist, an educator, and an ecologist. Uh, who calls the shores of the Elizabeth River home uh, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, also, we have Sam Bowling. Sam is an architect and project manager with WPA Architects, Work Program Architects out of Norfolk, Virginia. He was also the lead architect for the Ryan Resilience Lab at the Elizabeth River. Um, Louisa and Sam, thank you both for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you uh, and look forward to presentation about the Elizabeth River Project. If you could give us a uh, brief overview of what the Elizabeth River Project is uh, and start from there. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Waris, Chris, and Joanna for setting this up and inviting us. I'm very excited to join you all today. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and share a little bit about the Elizabeth River Project to start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Being in the driver's seat of a virtual Zoom presentation is pretty much my nightmare scenario, so please bear with me. <laughs> uh, we had some technical difficulties with the fancy setup today. <laughs> um, so I am Louisa Black with the Elizabeth River Project, um, and I'm going to start off by just giving an introduction to the organization, a sort of overhead view of what makes a living shoreline a living shoreline and Elizabeth River Project's history and contribution with living shorelines in Virginia. Um, and then I'll start talking a little bit more specifically about the Ryan Lab and hand it over to Sam, who has done an absolutely amazing job um, designing it and making it a reality. So. Our mission is to restore the Elizabeth River to the highest practical level of quality through government, organizational, and partner um, community partners. Um, so we started about 30 years ago, actually exactly 30 years ago this year, um, around a kitchen table, a group of concerned citizens who wanted to um, find a way to bring life back to a river that was at the time presumed dead. It was actually a national joke that was referred to on Seinfeld, like the water quality is so bad, it's like the Elizabeth River. <laughs> so we wanted to 
find a way to make the biggest impact possible on the quality of the river for its animals, its wildlife, and for the people and the economy of the river. Um, so there is a lot that I could say about how we have accomplished that in the last 30 years, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on our history with living shorelines. Um, so we actually were responsible for the very first voluntary living shoreline in Virginia, and that was at the Larchmont Library in 1997. Um, and here you can see how the shoreline is doing today. So this is called the Birdsong Living Shoreline, and you can visit it anytime you're in Norfolk. Um, we also partnered with um, many amazing community and business partners to save a historic wall at the Hermitage Museum using a living shoreline to absorb the wave energy and to stabilize the soil around it. Um, it was on the brink of collapsing and seriously at risk. Um, so as you can see, this living shoreline has done an amazing job of protecting it. And then one of our biggest projects and probably what we're best known for is Money Point, the Money Point restoration. Um, so Money Point had one of the nation's highest rates of cancer in the indicator fish, which is the mummy chog fish. Um, it had 10,000 parts per million pollution levels and the only fish species that was remaining in this, um, in this waterway was the mummy chog, um, which it was often found um, with serious deformities from um, contamination of creosote because this was a historic creosote processing um, site. Um, we planned a three phase restoration plan for this huge waterway with extremely high rates of pollution. And we've implemented at this point two of those phases. Um, so one of those phases involved scraping the bottom of the river for that creosote. Um, and another involved a living shoreline. And it also involved um, the nation's first living cap, which is where we actually scooped out um, the contaminated soils, um, took them <laughs> away. <laughs> um, we placed a living cap of oyster reefs and um, restored shoreline, and that was to um, prevent the water that flowed over that site to mix with the contaminated soils underneath. Um, so as you can see, it's been amazingly successful with 26 fish species um, and otters and dolphins returning to this site. Um, so these are just a couple of the highlights of work that we've done with living shoreline, li living shorelines. And since our work began 30 years ago, this river that was once presumed dead in a national joke of um, urban pollution has seen the return of bottlenose dolphins, pel brown pelicans, otters, and for the first time ever this year, a score of A on several categories of river health. And there are many aspects of Elizabeth River Project programming and restoration efforts that are responsible for this. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on what we do with living shorelines and how exactly they work. So I'm going to just move through the what, why, and how of living shorelines. Um, so living shorelines are often defined in opposition to a hardened shoreline. So a hardened shoreline is going to be something that is, um, is hardened off with a revetment, which is just really large stone or riprap with wooden bulkheads walling off the soil or concrete retaining walls. A living shoreline, by contrast, um, is a shoreline that is made up of natural materials such as plants, sand, stone, um, oyster reefs um, and other materials that are soft rather than hard. Um, so you can see in this cross section, um, shorelines are all going to have a low marsh area and a high marsh area. So here you can see mean low tide and mean high tide. And this is the low marsh here that's going to be inundated every day um, at high tide. And then the high marsh area is this section here, and this is only going to be inundated roughly twice a month um, with um, the monthly um, new moon and full moon high tides. Um, and then a little upland here. This diagram exaggerates um, 
the steepness of the grade that we are usually advocating for in a riparian buffer. So we want this to be spread out <laughs> significantly and not quite so steep. Um, but this section here is what we call a riparian buffer. And one way you can think about it is that a living shoreline is um, designed somewhat to protect the land from the water and a riparian buffer is designed to protect the water from the land. So where a living shoreline is stabilizing soil uh, so that it doesn't get eroded from wave action and from tide action, a riparian buffer is working to filter water as it flows from upland before it goes into the water. So something that makes Elizabeth River Project's shorelines unique, um, something that we've pioneered in Virginia is what's called hybrid shorelines. So what we actually do is we advocate for using the best of both worlds. Um, in this, in the Elizabeth River, there is a tremendous maritime economy and it's important to us to affirm that because that's the economic backbone of this area. Um, so in order to protect the river from and protect the shorelines from the wave action of the maritime economy, we advocate for using um, hybrid measures with um, stone sills, which you can see here. And also um, we use oyster reefs as a stabilizing measure. So oyster reefs are, <laughs> particularly important um, because they serve both as a breakwater and they also filter the water from nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, which are the three key pollutants of the Elizabeth River and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, oysters can filter up to 50 gallons a day. And before colonization, oysters were capable of filtering the full volume of the Chesapeake Bay in less than a week. Um, and the Elizabeth River Project, since we began, have actually been responsible for um, fully restoring um, the Eastern Branch and the Lafayette Branch of the Elizabeth River for oysters, um, which marks the full restoration of a branch of a river for oysters in Virginia. <laughs> um, so just to get into a little bit more detail of how this actually works, oysters are filter feeders. Um, so the way that they're filtering nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment is either by consuming them and making them a part of their shell or by um, packaging them into little pallets to really simplify it and um, releasing those. And in that state, they're heavy enough to just sink to the bottom of the, um, of the river. So they're biologically inert and not bioavailable to um, algae, for example. So that nitrogen isn't co contributing to algal blooms. Um, they are also carbon sinks. So another key component of their shells is carbon and they're able to absorb carbon dioxide and use that carbon to build their shells. Then once they die, the carbon again sinks to the ground and is no longer bioavailable. So they're really climate and ecological heroes, as well as powerful ways to protect the shoreline from wave action. So to dive in a little bit to more into why to do a living shoreline instead of a hardened shoreline, um, as I've talked about a little bit already, they are carbon sinks, both through their oyster reefs and through the marshes. Um, they trap sediments, just like oysters do, um, and that actually makes them capable of building up over time. So as sea level rises, if it rises slow enough, a marsh is able to build itself up in, in, at pace with the rising tide. Um, living shorelines also greatly improve water quality. They provide um, fisheries habitat. So the Elizabeth River at one time was... Um, was constituted primarily of acres and acres of shallow fisheries, which is what the native fish of this region require for their life cycle. So living shorelines are building that habitat back up. They're also acting as natural barriers to waves. Um, a living shoreline can absorb up to 50% of an incoming wave, of the energy of an incoming wave. And they are statistically proven to be more resilient against storms than bulkheads. Um, they're also cheaper than um, hard shorelines, um, and they're more durable long-term than bulkheads. Um, as you're probably familiar with already, most bulkheads and retaining walls and hardened shorelines tend to, over time, contribute to increased erosion around and underneath them. 
So to get a little bit more into how to install a living shoreline, um, this diagram kind of moves you through the steps. Um, so site preparation is something that Sam would know a lot more about than me. I'm um, coming to this as an ecologist rather than an engineer and architect, um, but it broadly involves grading um, and sometimes um, bringing in sand or soil to even that grade out. Um, you can see there in this first phase here, you'll plant your plugs, you'll protect those plugs from goose fencing and um, staking and wiring. Um, geese are scared of reflective ribbon, <laughs> which is really useful for us. So um, what we do when we plant a fresh shoreline is we hang reflective strips of ribbon all across the shoreline to um, ward geese off, which you might think that's a really like trivial concern for a large scale project like this, but it they geese can actually decimate a living shoreline within within a couple days, um, which you know is one of the things you have to think about when you're working with living organisms rather than hardened um, shorelines. You can see at the bottom here, oyster castles are just um, concrete structures that are engineered with lots of crevices for oysters to lay their eggs in, which is called spat. Um, and a quar log is um, coconut fibers that are placed at the lip of the shoreline to give um, that fresh soil or fresh sand some protection against the wave action and tidal action, because in this first one to three years of growing, the plants are not going to be stabilizing the soil very much. And then it takes about one to three years for those grasses to establish. The quar log degrades the oysters take root in the oyster castles and you have a living shoreline. So um, because of our work with living shorelines, we've seen some amazing success in our restoration efforts. And now as an organization, we're looking to the future to protect the river from the rising, the looming threats of sea level rise and climate change. So we wanna make sure that otters are here to stay, not just here for a little while and then leaving again once um, sea level rise and climate change makes this place untenable. So with that, let's move to the Ryan Resilience Lab. Great. Thank you, Louisa. That was exceptional. Um, I am going to uh, stop sharing for a second, pull up a video, and we will reshare. Um, this was a kind of promotional video that was made for the um, Resilience Lab, uh, and it's only about a minute long, so um, uh, music is not important. There's no narration, but um, this is going to give you just kind of a, a big picture overview of what the project looks like. I know Folks from our area have probably seen this uh, half a dozen times. Um, we've definitely had a pretty active marketing campaign, but for those from other areas, um, this is kind of <clears throat> what the project looks like overall. Um, so this building and site, the site's really only about three quarters of an acre in size. The building is about 6,200 square feet. So not a really big footprint. And we actually had to fit a lot of our program onto a fairly small area of the site to leave space for outdoor event space, the living shoreline and the riparian buffer. So um, we refer to this project as a little bit of a Swiss watch internally. Um, there's a lot of parts and pieces that had to fit very tightly together and work um, in, in concert with one another. Um, we, we didn't have the, the space to really sprawl out, but um, you get a sense of how close the building is to the street. Um, that is Collie Avenue, for those who are familiar with the Norfolk area. Um, kind of a up and coming uh, urban zone. And then it is uh, one of the few spaces in Norfolk uh, available to ERP at the time when they had to buy the land um, that was both urban and waterfront. So this part of Collie Avenue backs right up to um, Knitting Mill Creek. Knitting Mill Creek is the tributary of the Elizabeth River that we're located on. Um, and <laughs> There we go. Cool. So I'll go through this a little bit um, and give you guys just some more details about the project. We're going to zoom back out a little bit. Um, so again, I'm Sam Bowling. I was the, the uh, architect for this project. I've been working with Elisa and others at ERP now for about two and a half years. This project has been a little bit of time uh, cooking. It um, We kind of got caught by the COVID um, situation and had to transition to work from home and um, doing a lot of virtual meetings, but we powered through and as a team, we were able to um, have this project uh, meet a budget. The budget did increase a little bit, but um, our our main goal, and I think the, the, the primary driver for this project 
um, from the very beginning was accessibility. We wanted to differentiate the uh, resilience lab from other kind of very highly achieving sustainable projects um, by trying to use as many what we call off the shelf materials and systems as possible. Because um, really our goal is for others to be able to replicate these same systems, replicate the success of the project um, in the same way that Elizabeth River Project um, is able to install a living shoreline at your home. If you own a home that is on the water, um, that's a service they can quite literally provide. Uh, we wanted to try to aim for that same level of relatability with the project. So, um, you know, certain aspects of this project, um, we are uh, anticipating net zero, uh, and it's through a combination of, uh, you know, a tight and insulated building envelope and a pretty modest solar array. Um, and it's encouraging because it almost shocked us at how um, simple it was to achieve net zero through fairly straightforward means. Um, mechanical systems were off the shelf heat pumps. The lights are ordinary LEDs. Um, we're using pretty ordinary insulation strategies. So um, this is the kind of thing that we do want to talk about and we do want to share it and say, you know, this isn't unattainable. This is something that you can do with residential windows and wood siding, for example. Another major driver for our site design that is really related to the building was um, this mandate to do no harm. We know the site's going to flood. It's going to flood repeatedly. Um, and so we were uh, we were we were tasked with this idea of any surface that is going to make contact with the water as it's coming and going on the site um, needs to not be leaching chemicals, needs to be not depositing sediment. Um, so we focused pretty heavily on um, paving and uh, landscaping solutions. The whole ground floor of the building we'll get into in a, a few minutes is really designed to be very passive in the face of water coming and going. Um, because, you know, ultimately we're trying to kind of not, not leave a mark, so to speak, uh, on the ecology here, but just sort of support it. Um, and then lastly, our, our kind of big idea here was a, uh, an idea of being participatory rather than preventative when it comes to flood mitigation. Um, there's a couple different ways to approach flood proofing. Commonly, they're known as dry versus wet flood proofing. Dry being the keep the water out, build a dam. Wet flood proofing meaning let the water in and build to kind of, you know, survive the damage. And so it was that second approach that we really wanted to embrace. Um, but it went really far beyond the idea of building structure that could endure flooding, but rather an entire site approach that says, you know, we're we're going to be working with floodwaters. Sea levels are going to be rising. Floods are going to get worse and worse. So anywhere we have waterborne structures, they're either floatable or floodable. Um, they're made of kind of inert materials that won't contribute any nasty chemicals. Um, we, we sort of, you know, we looked at the, the whole site as one big sponge for water with native plants that are salt tolerant. Um, so everything was really trying to be um, passive versus active when it came to thinking about resilience. Uh, this is the site from just the other kind of view, giving you a better idea of some of those uh, water side structures. And just to orient people again, Collie Avenue is running. It's kind of that that wider street on the left side of the page um, running north south. And then 47th Street runs east west. And uh, if you follow it west at about three blocks, you're right smack dab in the middle of ODU's campus, Old Dominion University. Um, so we're kind of really in a cool nexus of urban locations. And this is a, a ideal spot to be demonstrating a lot of these types of um, sustainable and resilient uh, systems. So you can kind of get an overview of what the building is about. Um, I'm trying to stay more focused on our uh, on our resilient and shoreline supportive um, uh, components, <laughs> if if you will, because um, there's a lot to this building. This is the sort of project we could talk about for hours and hours, and you know, keep bringing up questions and answering them with things we had to think about during the design. But um, we want to try to keep to a time. Um, we did have five primary factors um, that we wanted to keep in mind as we were designing the building. Um, these were driven by uh, pretty constant conversations with the client and stakeholders. Um, we ran a, a number of stakeholder kind of input sessions, uh, both before and then during um, pandemic and working from home. Um, but these kind of big picture ideas um, started with climate adaptation, and that's really the traditional a beach house approach to resilience. You build your building up on stilts and you let the water flow underneath it. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the, the project was able to uh, have a certain level of self-sufficiency. So uh, on-site energy production, it's not off-grid, it is grid tied, um, but there's a battery backup as well um, that can help power certain emergency services for the building. Uh, all of our floating structures are 
um, designed in such a way that, you know, as floodwaters come and go, these structures are able to just kind of ride it out. We have a dock, we have a platform, and then we also have a shed, all of which are amphibiated and float up and down uh, when they need to. Um, the next one was absorbing the flooding. And again, that's that site-wide kind of mandate to absorb flooding. And unlike a lot of projects um, in this area, we aren't tying this project into any kind of hard stormwater um, piping. There's no connection to a municipal stormwater system. It's all handled in the site. It's all handled naturally through infiltration through either the green landscaping spaces or the um, uh, uh, pervious paving surfaces. And then the building itself has a kind of micro scale rainwater management system where all the rain that hits the roofs drains into gutters, which is then collected in a cistern under the building. That cistern is then back feeding into our gray water system, which we use to flush the toilets <laughs> in the building. So um, uh, no, no water is kind of being diverted into a municipal outflow system. Um, the next one was cultural resilience, and this was really an, uh, a critical one. Um, the building had to operate like a teaching tool. We had to have public access. This is that first primary goal of accessible kind of uh, lessons learned, teaching moments. Um, so the park in the back, this whole area is publicly accessible. Um, you saw that large kind of semicircular structure we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, that is designed to be a public amenity where people can come and hang out, get tours, fish off the edge of that. Um, I'm trying to turn this into a, a destination for folks in this area. And as North Collie slowly becomes what we've been terming the eco corridor, um, this is a message I want to start spreading further and further. Um, there's also public art that's going to be playing a part of this project. Uh, we're, we're working with different artists and um, trying to make sure that there's a, a kind of giving back aspect, um, not just the ego corridor, not just the public um, art and, and park that are part of our site, but um, the parking. In fact, you know, Collie Avenue is choked with cars and, and everyone complains about how hard it is to find parking to go to some of the bars and nightclubs there. So, um, you know, we're having agreements set up with the city that parking on site is going to be available to anybody after certain hours. There's EV uh, charging stations for electric vehicles that will also be made available to the general public. Um, so we're, we're trying to kind of, um, you know, not just kind of have, keep it all to ourselves, but give a lot of that back to the community around us. Um, the next one is energy resilience. Again, this is the kind of straightforward sustainable building stuff, the low carbon footprint, um, using sustainably harvested wood, um, using almost 100% wood framing, um, recycled materials, solar power, solar hot water heating, uh, passive solar design, uh, high efficiency systems, kitchen sink project. We sort of threw everything we could at it. Um, and then that last bullet is uh, planned retreat. This is a pretty fascinating one. Uh, it's unusual and everyone always asks questions about this, but the building does have an engineered lifespan. Um, our plan is that as sea levels rise, uh, this uh, site and building will be gradually given over to a permanent um, conservation easement. It'll be triggered by measurable increases in sea level rise, and it'll be a legal binding document, um, <laughs> something that we can't say no to in the future, change our minds. Um, but the uh, the plan is that once sea levels have risen to a certain threshold, which, to be honest, we're still working out exactly what that threshold is, what makes sense. Um, but at that point, the building will be abandoned and dis partially dismantled, um, and it will kind of leave its mark as a, um, a oceanfront uh, park of a sort, kind of a monument. So um, starting with site and building, we're kind of now going to go back into the details. And uh, we've mentioned it before, but um, we approached this like a uh, like a beach house that you might see at Hatteras or uh, you know something like that, where the whole ground floor is this flood damage resistant zone. Everything at the bottom edge of the building is meant to be flooded. It's um, CMU construction and um, you know exterior treated wood. Um, we took great pains to research which uh, chemical treatments were more and less toxic and make sure that we had the right ones. Um, and broadly speaking, everything above that is conventional. It's, uh, you know, just it, the normal kind of light wood, uh, light industrial or light commercial framing, sorry. Um, but then beyond that, we took some lessons learned from our experience working in this environment and, um, you know, having seen things go wrong in the past where um, we know that having um, wood piles, for instance, driven into the soil, but also used to support a building, have a tendency to rot. Um, that connection between totally submerged and totally exposed leaves an area of vulnerability. 
And so, you know, we we went with a different strategy of having a concrete foundation that would then support a wood superstructure above that. Um, all of our critical services are located well above the ground floor. Um, we pretty much only have gas and electric coming in on the ground floor, and those services are um, set up high enough that they're not going to be interrupted by um, even the 100-year flood. Um, but uh, all of our mechanical is on second and third floor. All of our, um, you know, major systems are up. We even went so far as to think about the uh, specification for our elevator. We have a three-stop elevator, and uh, it's an electric traction style where all of the um, machine room and everything is in the top. It's in the cab, and there's nothing in the bottom. There's no there's no hole. There's barely a pit, um, but there's no machinery or equipment down there beyond a sump pump and the emergency springs. <laughs> um, but that was intentional so that, you know, should there be a flood that inundates this entire site, um, the kind of path to getting back on track and bouncing back from that kind of catastrophe of a flood would be absolutely minimal. So moving on and talking a little bit more about the site. So Louisa gave a fantastic overview of living shorelines and how the site is kind of um, a, a restoration of the uh, natural pre-existing conditions before this area became developed. Um, what's also fascinating, as you saw in that kind of map graphic at the very beginning, is this project is sandwiched between two existing um, uh, wetland restoration efforts, uh, 47th Street Rain Garden and below that the 46th Street Wetland, um, both of which were projects by the Lafayette Wetlands Partnership, um, and they're still today maintained by that group. Um, so this project is really almost like taking those bookends and then connecting it right along the shoreline. And we've got some progress. Uh, Chris was asking before we started what our progress was, and I'd say this building is about 50% complete. Um, site work has started. And so these are some photos from just a few weeks ago. Um, those top images you can see, that's the um, sill structure. So Louisa mentioned the um, kind of stone sill that's there as a breakwater to help protect the shoreline from um, wave action. And that was the first thing that goes in. There's a really interesting approach to um, phasing the construction of a living shoreline. You can see in the bottom image, there's something in purple and something in yellow. The yellow is the existing wood bulkhead. So this site was, before we took it over, um, a small private marina, and it had a, a very old wooden bulkhead um, that just cut the site off. And, you know, there's kind of water here, wall, and then land. And so um, in, in terms of phasing, that actually it's left in place um, while the stone sill gets built around uh, where it's going to go. And on the land side, you can see we're starting to locate our uh, bulkheads for the dock and the boardwalk. Um, both of these are fairly small, confined structures that are going to uh, retain just a small amount of uh, area. And then the entire site around that is going to be sloping down. So once the uh, once the sill is, is built and these uh, bulkhead structures are in place, you're sort of framing the bottom and the top, and then you're, you're pulling out the bulkhead in the middle and regrading that, filling that area with sand and soil. Um, so that, that kind of, you're, you're almost opening up the space in the middle and then dropping everything in place. So it's really fascinating to watch it come together. And um, this is uh, this is sort of that, like, we're almost there and probably within the next four to six weeks, we'll actually see that grading start to happen. Um, and for those in the area, um, we're working on scheduling a hard hat tour for the Hampton Roads AIA, probably in the May, June timeframe. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so this is a kind of graphic we put together of this progressive flooding idea with the darker blue being what you'd expect for normal tidal, uh, you know, tidal ups and downs, the normal day by day thing. And then beyond that, really, where we expect to see, you know, minor flooding, and that's minor. And I, I do mean that major flooding is going to be several feet inside the building. Um, and so that idea of a ground floor that's built to flood, you cross your fingers and hope it doesn't happen. But 100 year floods are happening every five to 10 years now. Um, so this is something that we do really anticipate being an increase over time. Um, and it it starts to kind of drive home this idea of gray infrastructure versus green infrastructure. Um, this is something that became really central to our approach to designing this building um, and the site. So these are some graphics from the University of Maryland um, where they, they talk about the difference. And broadly speaking, uh, gray infrastructure is your old school um, impervious surfaces, concrete, asphalt, paving with gutters and drainage and underground pipes that all feed into 
a bigger pipe and that pipe feeds into your nearest tributary and body of water. <laughs> and the problem with this, of course, is that all the stuff that lands on our buildings, dust, pollutants, um, very fine metal particulate that comes out of car exhaust, there's so much stuff that just you know, rubber tire dust, it's all there and we don't really know it's there because you don't really see it. it blends in. But when the rains come, it washes all of that into the local bodies of water. It's kind of a mess. So green infrastructure says, don't do it that way. Uh, rather, let this stuff percolate kind of more naturally. Um, and so you start to treat every surface like it could potentially be a filter, this sort of sieve where rainwater and stormwater can flow naturally back into the groundwater um, with the soil and the undergrade um, actually functioning as that filter. So, um, you know, that's that's the natural way to approach it versus trying to uh, just kind of let it all run down through a pipe. And um, so for our site, we have four kind of major approaches to this. We've touched on a few of these, but not all in one picture. Um, the uh, so green dots, if those are uh, not too hard to see, <laughs> is uh, our, our kind of building building focused rainwater collection. This is what we talked about before, um, collecting all that rainwater. So we have um, uh, gutters and roof drains and all of the normal parts of, of light commercial construction. Um, but all of that water is actually being captured and it's piping down through liters into a pair of 5,000 gallon cisterns that sit under the building, um, just right, right actually next to where you walk in. So they'll be on display in full view. And um, so those will be filling up gradually with rainwater that's going to be stored temporarily and then feeding back into the building through a um, a non-potable water supply. And that water gets pre-filtered, it gets sterilized with a UV light chamber, and then it gets dyed, um, you're actually required by the plumbing code to inject a purple dye, and they specify purple. It's kind of fascinating, but um, so purple dye into the water, and then that gets piped back as a non-potable supply. All of the toilets in the facility are being supplied by that non-potable. So we're recycling 100% of our water our plumbing engineers are able to validate that given normal duty cycles, and especially considering that this building has a fairly large event space as part of it and outdoor classrooms, things like that, um, there's going to be a large number of visitors. So this water is going to get used and it's going to get cycled through, which is the other problem with water collection is it can't sit stagnant for too long. You have to release it if it stays for too long because it starts to, um, you know, grow unpleasant things in there. So um, our strategy for water reclamation there. Uh, and then the yellow dots show just where we have hard paving, all of our hard surfaces, every sidewalk, every paving, every plaza um, is either a pervious paver block uh, or a, a pervious material like a gravel or a crushed oyster shell. Um, so again, this is promoting the idea that every surface can really be the sponge to let water naturally percolate back through. Um, the orange dots show our landscaped areas, which obviously naturally are going to be pervious spaces um, but again, given the fact that this is a shoreline restoration, we know we're expecting flooding. They're native salt tolerant species. Um, and then the blue dots are showing where we have um, structured rain gardens. So these are more on the demonstration side. Um, so little constructed rain gardens and um, the idea being that there is some you know, didactic signage to help you know, visitors understand what they're looking at, why it's different from the grassy area right over there. Um, but then all of this wraps into our plaza at the entrance of the building, which is that smaller picture on top. Um, so it's a view of the entrance plaza. This is publicly accessible right off of Collie Avenue. Um, it's the main entrance to the building and it's fascinating. It's a kind of uh, microcosm of the whole site. Um, we're trying to kind of gather and take all the pieces of this uh, water strategy uh, and place a smaller version of them in this plaza. So that even if the only thing you do is walk up here and kind of look at the front door before you go, nah, maybe I'll come back another day, you at least get to touch and feel some of these uh, pieces and parts of the program um, just right from this kind of pedestrian zone. Um, so there's a large structured elevated rain garden um, and then the stairway uh, kind of climbs over that. That stairway is actually um, uh, made out of galvanized steel and then it has fiberglass grate treads. Um, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but fiberglass uh, grading became a really important part of this project for uh, for a lot of reasons, but um, mainly we wanted to make sure that we were, um, uh, for one, for safety, not capturing rainwater on top of the, the stairs that are exterior, um, but two, letting some solar infiltration happen through these uh, flat surfaces. We don't wanna be shading out um, the rain gardens, our living you know, walls, any of our green areas, um, we don't want them living in shadow constantly. So we have this kind of translucent um, structured grating. Um, and so that is my segue into the boardwalk. So these water structures on the on the project, there was um, kind of three major structures. 
Uh, the big circular structure is called the boardwalk. Next to that is the research dock. And then beyond that is a kayak launch. The kayak launch, pretty straightforward. That's that's oyster shell. Um, but that is to promote um, engagement with the river and uh, kind of recreational use. Um, so kayak tours will come and go from this space. Uh, just a block or so down, there's also a wheelchair accessible kayak launch that we're going to be working in partnership with. Um, the dock is there for research purposes. So um, one of the great... Um, outcomes of this project and the uh, the kind of public input process has been um, getting a lot of the local higher education institutions involved. Um, so VIMS, ODU, Norfolk State, um, William and Mary, half a dozen others have asked to be part of this process and to actually use some of the space in the living, uh, uh, the learning park and the, and the research doc for um, kind of on-site real-time research. So VIMS already has and has been maintaining uh, water quality monitoring on the site. They're going to continue that. It's actually going to be a data fee that's displayed in real time in the lobby. Um, but that was a, a major focus of this. Uh, this whole um, half of the site was really how do we how do we keep these higher education institutions engaged so that not just sort of the um, passive day to day teaching, but active research can happen here. Um, we also realized early on that the uh, site couldn't just exist as a kind of place where you walk around in the riparian zone and then there's this research dock that you don't get to visit because you're a visitor. Um, so we actually came up with this third space, which is the boardwalk. Um, the genesis for the boardwalk was wanting to have a place on the site where people could come in and have an, an opportunity to experience um, being out over the water, um, kind of like a kind of like a fishing pier, um, but kind of bringing you out onto the site, letting you walk over that living shoreline, this, this thing that takes so much work and effort to design and implement um, by this you know, team of people. And it you know, becomes a habitat for so many different types of um, you know, marine life that it really deserves celebration. And so the boardwalk became a way for us to uh, bring people out of this really um, kind of inspirational way and let them walk out over this living shoreline. Um, not only kind of be next to it, look over the railings, but we talked about that open fiberglass grating. Um, this fiberglass grating is something that you can literally look down past your feet um, and, and see the, the kind of um, plants and water and critters down below. Um, fiberglass became the savior in a way of this project. We, we were challenged on all of these waterside structures um, to come up with a way to keep them um, light and strong and ecologically sensitive. Those were kind of our three drivers. Um, lightweight, we didn't want to have really deep structural members because the deeper the structural member, the more it's going to cast a shadow, the more it's going to obstruct um, the plants underneath from growing in a healthy way. Um, has to obviously be strong and you know resist wave action, and potential hurricanes, those kinds of things. Um, and then ecologically sensitive, we needed something that wasn't going to actively be poisoning the water or creating problems. Um, we looked at steel and we looked at wood as alternative materials early on for these structures. And um, the the issues with both were that um, steel you know, has a tendency to corrode unless it's coated. That coating needs to be um, replaced or replenished every so often. Uh, wood also requires coatings that needs to be replenished. And it naturally is going to have, by the process of treating it, chemicals that will leach out into the water that we kind of want to avoid. So... Um, kind of faced with this neither option being a great one, um, we had the suggestion from our um, construction manager partner um, to look at fiberglass. And there's a whole cottage industry growing around fiberglass docks and water structures. Um, it's an industrial material, but it really is starting to find some cool applications within architecture. Um, and we were able to uh, actually figure out a way to get the entire boardwalk, all of the piles um, that are driven into the into the soil, um, and the superstructure and even the uh, the railings um, pre-manufactured and assembled out of uh, FRP, this fiberglass material. Um, and it'll be delivered to the site in kind of big chunks that they'll just crane into place. So it actually reduces the amount of time the contractors on site in the water doing this work. Um, the sections are fairly thin. They have a really high structural capacity. Um, and so, you know, our, our framing depths are similar to what we would have been able to achieve with steel. Um, and then, of course, the kind of floor surface can be an open grating, um, which allows that sunlight penetration so that we are not uh, shading out the uh, new living shoreline, shading out the wetlands. Um, and of course, it doesn't corrode. It doesn't leach chemicals. It doesn't ever need to be painted. So uh, that for us was kind of a breakthrough in the overall um, kind of understanding of this project. 
And so that's starting to go in on the photo on the left. You can actually see um, those composite piles. These are 12 inch fiberglass reinforced piles that march out into the waterway and then actually lift up a little bit, um, come back down. There's this kind of really elegant elevation that happens as you get farther out so that your view back to the shoreline is even that much more dramatic. And it also kind of, as it pulls up, it allows more of that sunlight penetration down um, underneath. Um, and then on the on the right there is kind of one of our uh, early renderings out of Revit of what that transparency is going to actually look and feel like. Um, and then our floating dock is sort of the last piece of the puzzle for all of this. Um, the floating dock is again designed um, not as a, a hard structured thing, but something that kind of can rise and fall with the tides, rise and fall and adapt actually to changing sea level um, as, as it needs to. Um, and then that gangway is the same uh, same basic material as the um, boardwalk. So the, the, the walking surface is open and uh, designed to allow um, you know, sunlight to penetrate through to not shade out that wetland. So kind of keep, keeping a lot of those same ideas in practice as we move through. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Louisa. Thank you so much, Sam. That was <laughs> out of breath. Amazing. Over <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, yeah, so um, I wanted to conclude and start opening up our Q&A session. Thank you so much for the overview of the purpose and design of the building, Sam. Um, and as we kind of have talked throughout, the purpose of the Ryan Lab and the living shoreline on the Ryan Lab is to not just be a tool of building material resilience, but also of building a culture of ecological resilience and stewardship. So um, we want this to be a teaching tool and an opportunity for partners in all different sectors to explore this model, engage with it, and consider replicating it. Um, so coming in October, the lab will be open to the public, um, and one of the key audiences that we're hoping to reach is architects and engineers. Um, so I would love to start taking your questions, and I would also love to hear how this lab can be a resource to you in your industry and your community. Well, thank you both, uh, Louisa and Sam. That was a, a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, there, there are a few questions that have come through. Uh, I'll start from the end. Um, there's a question uh, about the city of Norfolk uh, having a, I think it's base flood elevation. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a question about going higher than the three feet um, mm -hmm. that the state currently has. Um, the state is possibly looking at going higher than that three foot base flood elevation. Uh, is that a consideration that was uh, that was thought through uh, on your end, Sam? It was, and I see you there, Gene. Hi. Um, yeah. So, and as I think Rob maybe even jumped in to help answer the question, um, our ground floor is seven and a half feet above um, mean low low, and the um, base flood elevation is eight. We're in AE eight um, for our flood zone. Um, and then Norfolk, we're in the um, coastal resilience overlay, which requires an additional foot over the base flood elevation. So four foot really is kind of our datum line where every system and every um, um, piece of equipment is at minimum no lower than four feet. Um, but then the building itself is 10 feet above the finished floor. So our first floor at seven and a half, we're actually going up 10 feet above that. Um, so we've kind of got a... Um, a functional understory. Um, we early on said, well, if we're going to have to come up four to five feet, why not just go the rest of the way up and build a story that's, you know, that's down at, at the normal level. It allowed us to have um, an accessible uh, entrance at the ground floor for people in wheelchairs or with just mobility issues. Um, and it allowed us to actually use a lot of that space under the building for storage. Um, since ERP is a kind of active construction company, they're building these uh, living shorelines are installing rain barrels and rain gardens for for homes all over the region. Um, they have a lot of equipment and storage needs, um, and so that very naturally fit to that purpose. Um, we also use some of that ground floor space for an outdoor classroom um, that just kind of opens right up onto the plaza and kind of whole learning park, living shoreline area. Um, it, it was a it was kind of a deliberate choice to use all that, but. Um, to another point, and this is not exactly what Gina's asking, she's asking about state guidelines, um, which I would actually would like to do some more research. Maybe Gina, I'll email you after this because I'd love to talk about this. Um, we um, we wanted to take advantage of Norfolk's resilience quotient, which is a new zoning requirement for new construction. Um, and it basically is a, a points-based system where 
um, based on your square footage, you're required to achieve a certain base number of credits. And um, we said, heck yeah, let's just try, try to get as many as we could, max it out. Um, so, you know, kind of similar to going for the lead gold or the lead platinum, um, we wanted to get as many credits as possible within the Norfolk uh, Resilience Quotient to demonstrate those. So again, um, developers, contractors, builders could come to the site and understand how was it implemented? What would they need to do on their projects? Um, again, right back to that whole idea of this is a demonstration project about kind of the accessibility of these pieces of technology and, um, uh, you know, standard approaches. Um, so I think we were required to get three and we're getting 15 or 20 credits for the resilience quotient. So are there any more coming through? And I saw Mark's question about hard hat tour. Yes, absolutely. I'm working with Kevin right now on that. Um, hoping for May, June. More, more info to come. <laughs> Fantastic. And I do have another question that came through another channel here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this one ties into, I'm going to combine two of the questions I received here. In terms of public-private partnerships and uh, the Elizabeth River Project, so the Elizabeth River watershed touches most, uh, if not all, of the, the city south of Hampton Roads, right? And it eventually flows out into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, does this create an opportunity for uh, partnerships with some of those cities that are uh, south of Hampton Roads or, or that would touch the Elizabeth River? You said the cities that are south of Hampton Roads or in southern Hampton Roads? Or in southern, either, either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so we have a, um, we work actively with the resilience departments of all of the cities of the Elizabeth River watershed. Um, and we also have, um, so our big tool for business partnerships specifically is called the River Star Businesses Program, which is an incentivizing tool to give businesses the, um, the knowledge and sometimes the funding needed to implement resilience or environmental stewardship measures. Um, so that River Star Businesses Program touches all of the Elizabeth River watershed, including Southern Hampton Roads. Um, and actually Money Point, um, the spot that I was talking about, is a project in Chesapeake um, near the Great Bridge Blocks area. Yeah, does that answer your question? I think it does, yes. Sorry, it's not your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll write in if it did not, so. Yeah, <laughs> send me a fist shake if not. <laughs> Can y'all talk more about the amphibious sheds? Sure, of course. Um, let me actually see if I can find the graphic. We might have a way to look at that real fast. Okay, there, there it was. So um, th we have two outdoor, you know, storage sheds on the site. They are um, pre-manufactured. They're like a, um, they're like these little metal barns you buy and you put in the back of your house. And the point of that again is um, knowing that a lot of folks living in Norfolk and the surrounding areas. Um, need to have these kinds of outdoor structures. They want to have a little shed for their lawnmower, for their wood shop, or whatever. Um, we wanted to address some ways to think about um, making them resilient if you're in a coastal floodplain. Uh, so one of those, the the one that's closer to the building, is uh, using kind of the traditional method of it's built up on a platform that raises the building up, um, you know, four feet. There's steps, it goes up, and that it's kind of like the this is this is the most basic version of what you'd have to do to just build the thing out of the floodplain. Um, the other shed that is closer to the shoreline, um, it is uh, it is similar to the floating dock. It has the same um, polypropylene foam filled floats, um, and we essentially designed it as a kind of cradle system where um, there's a there's a platform that is bolted to the bottom of the shed um, that has these floats on it, and that then rests on some cross beams on uh, wooden piles. And if the flooding is to ever get that high, which it almost certainly will within probably the next 10 years, <laughs> um, it will it will be able to um, kind of float on those on that platform um, and and ride out a severe flood environment. Um, there's there's been a number of people who've done similar things. And so we want to just take some of that existing knowledge, put it kind of out on display. Um, and and show people that it's it's very much possible, um, but also be able to point out some of the things that you'll have to keep in mind, like um, what sort of things can you store in these sheds? How do you have to connect it? Um, you know, what are the kind of bare minimum requirements to do this in a safe way um, so that it, you know it doesn't break loose and float away and damage property? 
are sheds required to be out of the footplanes? Um, I'm actually not sure if they're required to be, um, but I know that for our purposes, we wanted to um, at least leave the one that's designed to float a bit lower. Um, so they're kind of at two different heights. Um, so that, that amphibiated shed is, I think, three or four feet lower than um, it's, it's basically right at the um, right at the design flood elevation. Or I'm sorry, it's at the base. It's at the base flood. It's right at seven and a half, and then it'll, it'll float up and down. I get I get cool. the two terms backwards in my head every day. <laughs> uh, Lisa, how many types of plants are incorporated into your standard <laughs> living shoreline? Ooh, <laughs> I love this question. Um, so the the plant backbone of every shoreline is going to be. Um, Spartina alterniflora. I'm sorry to use the scientific names. The common names are just like <laughs> meaningless to me. So Spartina alterniflora is the plant that likes to be more in the water, the low marsh grass. And then Spartina patens is the high marsh grass. So those are our two native salt tolerant marsh grasses that sort of anywhere you go, that's a natural shoreline built or otherwise, that's what you're going to see. Um, and then there are a couple of other um, like backbone grasses, like um, Juncus girardi or Andropogon girardi um, and um, salt marsh bulrush. There's a common name. Um, so the, the backbone, the sort of skeleton of the marsh is going to be built on those grasses. Um, and then there's a constellation of like 15 to 20 other associated species. Um, and those vary from site to site, um, but they're mostly going to be um, more like grasses and forbs with the occasional shrub like um, salt bush or high tide bush, which are both aptly named. <laughs> um, so because this is a teaching tool, we tried to throw in more flowering plants where possible. And we do the same thing with our built living shorelines at businesses and homes. Um, but yeah, to answer your question as simply as possible, it's going to be a skeleton of like a huge amount of those three grasses. Um, and then a scattering of plants that are dependent on the site, on um, what it's for, whether it's like a teaching tool or like a Raleigh functional tool. Um, and then the riparian buffer is just a bonanza with anything you want. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions that have, uh, haven't seen anything else come in through the chat? Any other questions? Oh, and I also would love to shout out SGA, who was responsible for designing the living shoreline and, and the landscaping throughout the site and has done an absolutely amazing job. Yeah, very, very quickly for the purposes of, I forgot to do it at the beginning. Um, the project team, broadly speaking, WPA was the architect. Uh, SGA, Stromberg, Gehring and Associates were our landscape designers. Um, Timmins did uh, our civil engineering for utilities. Um, Pace Collaborative was our MEP, Spate Marshall was our structural, um, uh, I'm sure GET did all of our geotechnical, I'm trying to think of who else maybe uh, I need to shout out, but that was the core team. Oh, and then Horrigan is our, um, our GC, they're doing uh, construction management at risk. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I, th I think that's our time for today. Uh, thank you, Sam uh, and Louisa both uh, for this incredible presentation. Um, I think that there will also be uh, questions that will continue to come in throughout the week. So I'm sure that uh, we'll, we'll pass those on as they come through. Uh, but I, I look forward to seeing everybody at some of the uh, uh, following uh, Resiliency Week uh, events that Chris mentioned. Uh, Chris, did you wanna follow up on any of those the rest of the week again, just as a reminder? Yes, um, some other great speakers coming up. As I said, tomorrow, community, economic transitions and resilience, talking about food resilience and using kind of your local natural materials to build a stronger local economy. Uh, Wednesday's decarbonization and the built environment, talking about how to create an electrified economy and get away from fossil fuels, whether that be cars or buildings or what else. And then Friday is master planning for resiliency, you know, obviously talking about master planning, how we start from you know, the, the planning stage to the built environment, planning for resiliency from the start. So it's going to be a, a, you know, a great week of education and presentation. So please, if you can, join as many as possible. 
and have a great week. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.